Well, good evening, everyone. I know for some of you it's already morning. And uh, <clears throat> I welcome you to the study here. We've been continuing through an understanding of um, the, third the three angels' messages of righteousness by faith. And we're going to be looking at A.T. Jones' 1895 General Conference Bulletin, uh, his 22nd sermon that he did in 1895 at the General Conference. But before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Gracious Heavenly Father, we are thankful that we can study your word. We're thankful for the messages that we have received from A.T. Jones and the relevance uh, for this movement and for our lives. We know that uh, we are in a battle with self and uh, we need to be equipped with the weapons of warfare, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, the breastplate of righteousness, um, uh, the, the feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. I know there's others. Helmet of salvation, I think I said. And we know, Lord, that the most important uh, weapon is your word, the sharp two-edged sword that cuts uh, both ways. And we know, Lord, that um, we are pricked to the heart as we study these messages, we recognize that we are sinners in need of your grace and mercy. And we know, Lord, that the faith that Christ exercised, we can exercise. And so um, we are learning how to do that day by day in our experience and walk with you. And we just pray that each person who studies these things will experience um, a greater trust and dependence upon God, upon you and less dependence upon ourselves. So be with us now through thy spirit, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, hello again, everyone. Now, um, now every time I, I present, I, I sort of want to do a summary of, of things, but we've covered a lot of things, and I think the main Thing to understand as we study this message is uh, that Christ is our example, that he's not just substitutionary in the sense of he does everything in our place, but he is, uh, his work is one that affects an actual change in us. So Christ wants to live in us. And he wants us to live in him. And that's why he came and took our nature. And, and this truth has been obscured in various ways. Um, A.T. Jones has laid this out for us so far um, in a methodical manner. But it it's, it's goes against our nature. And, and it's, it's a difficult truth to accept. Because either we want to do things ourselves, we want to think of ourselves as good. And, you know, sometimes, you know, we try to even encourage people who are struggling. Well, you know, you have a good heart, you know, you're, you know, you're, you just have these problems. But in reality, um, we are not good. We don't have a good heart. Uh, the struggle we have is not with external events, even though we can, we can, you know, maybe how we were raised or the things we were taught or different experiences that have um, knocked us down. And, and so sometimes we like to focus, well, that is the problem, this other thing. But in reality, the problem is us. You know, when, when we have a problem with another person, it's easy to point out that person's flaws and that they made us feel a certain way or they did this to us. Uh, but the reality is, if we were affected by it, 
it says a lot more about us than it does about the other person. One is we have no control over the other person. And in, in some ways, we have no control over ourselves, except as we yield our will to God. Because we are really powerless without Christ uh, to change. And, you know, we can have all these um, desires or wishes to, to be different than we are. Uh, but the reality is if, if we think that there's something good in us, uh, we're never going to yield ourselves. Still, still yielded everything to his father. <clears throat> now it says my internet connection is unstable, so hopefully I don't uh, disconnect. Um, but anyway, let's... Uh, Go on here, and we're going to start reading uh, what Jones has written. <clears throat> so Jones says, Our lesson tonight will begin with Ephesians chapter 1, verses 19 to 21. The lesson is still the study of what we have in Christ where he is. This is the part of that prayer that ye may know what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who to believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places or in heavenly existence, as we have had in the second chapter and sixth verse. And that same thought is given in Philippians 3, verse 8 to 10. I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things. And I do count them, but done, that I may win Christ and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection. That is the same thing that the Lord desires that we all shall know, as recorded in the text, that ye may know what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him from the dead. Now says Paul, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. That is, not his power alone in raising Paul from the dead, <clears throat> uh, after he had died and gone into the grave. That is not it. But it is to know the power of his resurrection now while we live. That is, the power which is brought to us by him, by which we are crucified with him and are dead with him and buried with him and then made alive with him and then raised with him and seated with him at the right hand of God in heaven. That is the power which he referred to, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, if by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead or out from among the dead. He wants to know the power of Christ's resurrection in order to attain for himself unto the resurrection out from among the dead. The man who in this life never knows the power of Christ's resurrection will never know it in the other life. True. He will be raised from the dead, but he will not know the power that raised from the dead. So that whoever does not get acquainted with the power of Christ's resurrection before he dies will never know the power of Christ's resurrection from that death. There is the Lord's Prayer, that I might know what is the exceeding greatness of his power um, toward the man that believes, according to the working of his mighty power, which he wrought in Christ when he raised him um, from the dead and seated him there. In him, we know the power that raises us from deadness in trespass and sins along with him and seats us with him in the heavenly existence. So now we will look at Ephesians 1, verse 20 and 21. 
and set him at his own right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality and power and might and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this world, but also in that which is to come. Now, I want to point out something here, a um, couple of things. But, but first, uh, I was giving a study uh, this afternoon. And um, in the study, we addressed um, James and John when they went to Christ with, with their mother, asking that one sit on the right hand and one on the left hand when Christ comes into his kingdom. And, and later in, in Luke there, you're going to find uh, that Jesus is going to be crucified between two thieves, one on his right hand and one on his left hand. And James and John were asking because they figured those are the most important places right on the left and the right of Christ. And so that's why they asked for this. Now, Jesus said, um, do you know what it is you're asking? Or you don't know what it is you're asking. Um, he says, are you able to drink up the cup that I drink from and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they said, we are able. Now, of course, they didn't really understand what he was talking about. They might be thinking of um, you know, cup is, is in something, some other way, not the cup of death and not the baptism of death. And and yet, you know, Jesus says, well, you will drink from the cup that I drink from and be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with. But it's not for me to give. You know, who's going to sit on my right or my left? That's of my father. Now, um, so when we look at this here, we know that Christ is set down um, at the right hand of the father. So we have this this image of of this um and yet you know james and john wanted to be on his left and his right and of course we see the two thieves now one is going to be saved and one is lost the the malefactors um but this this um and, and he's going to go on in here. And I'm just trying to collect my thoughts to sort of focus them a bit. But we don't really fully understand what God is asking us, asking of us. That is, we don't really understand uh, what this cross means and what it means to sit at the right hand of the Father, what that means for Christ, that place that he has found and so i just want you to keep that in the back of your minds as we look at this because to sit in the heavenly places in christ jesus we all sit at the right hand of the father right that's what really jones has been saying because when christ sits at the right hand of the father, we are sitting at the right hand of the father <clears throat> um this power of God, which raises us in Christ above all the principalities and powers and might and dominion that are in this world, is what we are studying tonight. Therefore, we must study first what is the nature of these principalities and powers which are in this world. Now, this is another important point because it's easy to get caught up in this world, in the politics of this world. Um, and yet we're supposed to rise above those things. Before this, however, let us notice once more that there stands the fact that in Christ we have and are to know what is the power which raises us in him and with him above all principalities and power and might and dominion that are in this world. There is a separation of church and state. There is a separation from the world that puts us in the place where we have better protection than from the powers of this world. There stands this fact of faith. Now, as to the nature of these powers, read right on into the second chapter for further connection. And you hath he quickened or made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the 
course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. There is a spirit that works in this world in the children of disobedience. And that spirit is the spirit of this prince of the power of the air. The German says, after the prince that in the air rules, namely after the spirit that to this time has worked in the children of unbelief. Formerly, when we were dead in sins, we walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the world. Now, from that word prince comes an idea of principality. In monarchical forms of government, there are principalities, dukedoms, kingdoms, and empires. A principality is the jurisdiction, the territory, or dominion of a prince. A dukedom is the dominion of a duke. A kingdom, the dominion of the king. And the empire, uh, the dominion of an emperor. In the next text, Christ has raised us above all principality and power and so on that is in this world and that is of this world. He has raised us above the rule of the spirit that rules in the children of disobedience. We can be glad, therefore, and thank the Lord that in Christ we are raised above this prince and all his jurisdiction and all his power. That is the thought. For in Christ, he has raised us far above all principality and power and might and dominion that are in this world. Now the sixth chapter of Ephesians, beginning with the tenth, tenth verse. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. So I guess Jones had this, I didn't read this over, so he has somewhat the same idea as us, as, as we have here. <clears throat> now, who is it against whom the Christian is to contend in this world? As relates to the principalities and power and empires of this world, who is it with whom the Christian is to contend? The devil that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Then when any government is sent, set against any Christian, interferes with him and beats him, is the Christian, Christian wrestling with that government? Is he contending with it? No. He is wrestling with the devil. And that is what we want to get our minds upon. We are to understand that when governments, kingdoms, emperors, and rulers persecute the Christian, persecute us, we have nothing to do with them as such. We're not warring against them. We're not wrestling with them. We are wrestling against the devil and warring against him. And this suggests a testimony that came last spring in which it was stated that the ministers should never forget to hold before the people everywhere and all the time that the strifes and commotions and contentions and conflicts that are present presented outwardly in this world do not come simply from this world and from the things that we see. They are only the result, the outward workings of the spiritual powers that are out of sight, that all these elements of evil that are working up and that we see coming so fast are simply the outworkings of that power, of that spirit that is back of them. And the instrumentalities that we see spreading abroad the Lord's message and carrying forward his work demonstrate on this side that these are simply the outward workings of the spirit and power of God that is back of these. And the word is given that we ministers see to it, that we call the attention of the people to the fact that all these commotions and conflicts and contentions between right and wrong are simply the contentions between Jesus Christ and Satan, that it is the great controversy of all ages. It is so easy for us to get our mind upon men um, and governments and powers and think we are contending we are not to do anything against governments because it is written, let every be soul be subject unto the higher powers. We're not to contend against the government. Every Christian will always be in harmony with any right law that any government can make. So he never raises any question with himself as to what law is going to be made this way or the other in this respect. So far as the government legislates within its own jurisdiction, 
He does not care what laws are made there because his life as a Christian in the fear of God will never come into conflict with any right law that is made, with any law that Caesar may make within his own jurisdiction, which God has set to him. When Caesar gets out of that place and gets beyond his jurisdiction into the kingdom of God, then of course every law he makes, the Christian will be in conflict with because he is right and the other thing is wrong. The Christian has not changed his attitude, but the other power has. Therefore, we are not to have our minds upon whether we are contending against the government or not. We have nothing to do with that. We are to have our minds upon the fact that if the government gets out of harmony with right and takes such a course that it conflicts with us, we are not then contending with it. We are always contending against the devil. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Governments are flesh and blood. Men's, courts, judges, legislators, they're all flesh and blood. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against wicked spirits in high places. That's the marginal reading. The margin is in heavenly places, which would refer to this heavenly jurisdiction in which Jesus Christ rules. <clears throat> The verbal translation of the 6th chapter and 12th verse runs thus. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against authorities, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against the spiritual power of wickedness in the heavenlies. It is the same heavenlies in which God has raised us up with him and set us with him in the heavenlies, far above all principalities and power and might and dominion that are upon the earth. So that the marginal reading of that verse is the correct one. Wicked spirits in heavenly places. Ours reads wicked spirits in high places. Actually, I think the King James said spiritual wickedness in high places. The German reads fully as forcibly as the Greek there. Thus, for we have not with flesh and blood to contend, but with the prince and power, namely with the Lord of the world, that is the God of this world, Satan. So then we have not to wrestle with any flesh and blood, but with the Lord of the world, namely with the Lord of the world that is in the darkness of this of this world, but with the Lord of the world that in the darkness of this world rules with the base spirits under heaven. And that is strong. That is forcible. We see who it is. It is the Lord of this world. It is he against whom we wrestle. The one who rules in the darkness of this world, the prince of this world that in the darkness of this world rules. Now we know, at least ought to know, that it is not going to be very long until every dominion of this earth is going to be under the rule of the Lord of this world, who rules in the darkness, and all are going to be bound in one and aimed at the truth of God and those in whom it is represented in this world. Now I wish all knew that we are going to be there soon. I wish that every Seventh-day Adventist knew that which is the fact, that we are at the point now where all the kingdoms and dominions of the earth are, as such, set against the truth of God. But if there be those, I do not say there are, who do not know this, it will be but a very short time in the way in which these, which things have been going lately and are going now, before they will be forced to recognize it. Now, we sometimes take a look back here. So this is 1895. It's a while ago. But we know that Jones uh, believes that the mighty angel of Revelation 18 has come down in 1892 or 1893, in that period, right? And so now he's in 1895, and he sees this progression that is occurring. Now, if he were to... Uh, be here today and see what's happening in this world, I, I think he would be um, very shocked at what he sees. I mean, evil has gone on much farther, but it's not so much the world. If he, if he looked at what the church is, and not just the Protestant churches, but Adventism itself, um, I don't know if he would even recognize um, the worship of Adventists as being Seventh-day Adventists. The world has drastically changed. And we are clearer, we are nearer now 
more clearly nearer now than when uh, we first believed. We know that Christ is coming soon. How soon, we do not know. But we know we're in the midst of fulfilled prophecy. And uh, so that's where we are, where, where Jones was, because things were going in the direction that Christ was going to come soon. But Christ didn't come because things changed. And how they changed and why they changed, well, has a lot to do with the church itself. And we're sort of in that same boat with this movement. Are we going to accomplish the task that God gave us or not? <clears throat> but we are in a time where people are going to recognize, they're going to be forced to recognize what's happening. As I mentioned here once before, the United States has been held before the world and has always stood as the, as the very citadel of liberty of rights and of freedom of conscience. Right. And we know that's true. But we can see that that's not the case uh, today. And because um, they might believe that they're talking about human rights or liberty of rights and freedom of conscience. But all of the things of the Constitution are being set aside. And Switzerland was one little country, one little republic in Europe where freedom was likewise most full. Yet Switzerland and the United States are the two countries now on earth that are doing most against the remnant and the seat of the church who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. And England now has, has now actively joined these. Now, when these countries, which have been the exemplars of the world, of the rights of man and the freedom of conscience, set themselves up against God and against the truth, then isn't it time that we learn that all the world is now under the rule of Satan? ready to be swung against the truth of God and the power of Jesus Christ. So one of the things I think about here was back in 2019. Um, uh, Tyler um, from the School of the Prophets, of course, Tess and Parminder and others, were, were saying that um, the Sunday law is not going to be about Sunday. It's going to be about human rights. And they tried to make the argument that um, that wokeism is is really about human rights, but of course we know it's not, because the rights of others are trampled by the so-called uh, this type of human rights. And the thing about uh, individual rights, when you protect the right of the individual. Um, you don't need to worry about the rights of groups. That is, group rights um, will always trump individual rights. That is, when you have identity groups seeking their rights as a group, the rights of the individual will cease. And so that's what we have in the world today, is that individual rights um, are taken away from us and, and we have these so-called group rights which of course aren't rights at all if individual rights are protected then you never have to worry about the group but anyway um, we can see that uh, that the world is in a pretty bad state at the present time which we're all aware of when it comes to rights yet in the face of it all I say that in Christ we are all right, for in him there works that power that raises us with him from the dead, and that has seated us at the right hand of God in the heavenly existence, far above all the power and might and dominion and principalities that are upon the earth and in the hand of, of Satan. And just now, as we are to be forced into that conflict, isn't it good that the Lord Jesus comes with his blessed truth to shine forth before us and to raise us to where he sits so that we shall know that we are above all these things all the time and triumph over them. And this is, of course, what the gospel is about. It's being in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, not being affected by the things of the world, trusting in God's kingdom um, instead of trusting in ourselves or the things of the world. 
So Jones goes on, he says, now we will study these things a little further. This is so much for the principality. Uh, but he says he has raised us far above all principality and power. The word power, you can look at the Greek word whenever you choose yourself, and you will see that the absolute meaning of the word is the power of authority that is exercised as of might as against right. That is what the word means. The literal translation is authority. There are accommodated uses of the word, that is true, aside from the absolute meaning. In accommodated uses, the character of the power is proved by the relationship in which it stands. For instance, if that word should be used of the power of Christ and the authority of the Lord, it would be a proper and legitimate authority, of course, because it is the authority of the Lord. But when it is used of the powers of this world, in every instance, it takes its association from the nature of this world and the spirit that rules here, and then it runs clear back to the absolute meaning, which is the authority of the power of might as against right. Now, this reminds me of um, Revelation. And we have... Um, <clears throat> Uh, in Revelation 13. Um, so we're going to go there. I'm just going to share the screen. <clears throat> and we should all be familiar with this. Now we know that there is these beasts. So if we look at Revelation chapter 12, we have uh, pagan Rome, right? It's going to be described. It's going to persecute God's people for 1260 years, a time, time and a half, right? And then in chapter 13, John says, I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and 10 horns, and upon his horns, 10 crowns, and upon his head, heads the names of blasphemy. And we know in chapter 12, the great red dragon has seven heads and 10 horns, but it is crowns upon the heads. Here we see the crowns upon the the horns. So this is the papal beast. This is the time of, of the papacy. And the beast which I saw was like a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth was the mouth of a lion. And the dragon, that's the previous beast in chapter 12, gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Now, um, in the study of this, if you look at... Uh, uh, these words, uh, we got power, that's just dunamis, right? Now, uh, the word that is uh, is authority, um, and I'm going to just try to see if I can find this here. So just hang on. So the verse that he's looking at is in Ephesians. So let's go over there. <clears throat> um Chapter 6, right? Um, where's the verse where he's talking about power? I'm not sure if I'm looking at the right verse. Okay, against powers. There it is. So when you talk about principalities, now he's talking about powers. You can see that this word, 1849, the Greek word, is the words that he's talking about. It's the same word in Revelation 13, right? So when it talks about, or in verse two, he gave him his power, that's dynamis, right? That's a different word. But it's this word, great authority, this authority. We know that the papist, uh, pagan Rome, when it gave it its power and its seat, it was pagan Rome's power and seat to give, correct? Do you understand what I'm saying? Because he gave him his power. That was his power and his seat, right? The government, the city. But was the great authority his to give? Could the dragon 
It doesn't say he gave him his power, his seat, and his great authority, right? This is a so authority that is God's prerogative alone, correct? You see what I'm saying? Yeah, correct. Okay, so so it's just a, something that comes to mind as we look at that verse um, that Jones is talking about. So that's the power of might against right. When it's used by the powers of this wor world, that's they don't have that authority to use. <clears throat> okay. Where did their start in this universe? The assumption that is the, the taking of any authority or power of might as against right, it originated with the rebellion of Lucifer in that assumption of self away back there. He brought that power into this world and fastened it upon this world by deception when he got possession of this world. Therefore, that word is properly used to show that when God in Christ has lifted us above all the principality and power of this world, it is above this power of might as against right, which is the power of Satan as he has brought it into this world and as he uses it in this world. This simply emphasizes the thought we mentioned a moment ago, that our contest is simply the contest that has been waged from the beginning between the two spiritual powers, between the legal and the illegal powers, between the power of right as against might and the power of might as against right. The contest is between these two spiritual powers. We have been under the power of might as against right, the power of force. Jesus Christ brought us to the knowledge of right as against might, the power of love. We forsook the dominion and power of might as against right, the power of force, and have joined our allegiance to the power of right as against might, the power of love. And now the contest is between these two powers, and concerning us. The contest is always between these spiritual powers. Whatever instruments may be employed in this world as the outward manifestation of that power, the contest is always between the two spiritual powers, Jesus Christ and the fallen prince. Let us follow this then a little further and see wherein we have the victory and wherein he has brought to us the victory over these illegal powers. This power of might is against right. Read in Colossians 2, beginning with the ninth verse. In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands, in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead, and you, being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with Christ, having forgiven you all trespasses. He's made you alive together with him. You see, it is the same story we read in the second of Ephesians the other night, that he has made us alive and raised us up with him from the dead and made us sit with him where he sits. But now here comes in the key of how this victory came to us in him and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. Or as the margin of the German re read, reads, uh, triumphing over them in himself. Colossians 2.15. The word power here is the same word in the Greek that expresses this power of might is against right. I need not turn to the parable Jesus spake. When a strong man armed keepeth his palace, his goods are in peace. But when a stronger than he shall come upon him and overcome him, he taketh from him all his armor wherein he trusted and divideth the spoil. Satan was the one who originated the authority of might is against right. By deception, he became the head of this world by becoming the controlling power or the head of him who was the head of the world. 
and having taken Adam and his dominion under his control, he became the head of this dominion, the head of this world, and the head of all principality and power in the world and of it. But a stronger than he came into the world. We know he is stronger because the battle has been fought and won. A second Adam came, not as the first Adam was, but as the first Adam had caused his descendants to be at the time at which he came. The second Adam came at the point of the degeneracy of the race to which the race had come from the first Adam. That second Adam came thus and disputed the dominion of this one who had taken possession. The contest was between these two upon the earth. It was a contest as to whether the spoil should be divided or whether it should be kept intact in the hands of him who had taken it by might as against right. He who came into this rebellious dominion proved to be stronger than he who had possession, and he defeated him at every step while he lived. Then in order to show to the universe how completely more powerful he is than the other, Jesus not only defeated Satan at every step while he was alive, but after that he gave himself over, dead, into the hands, into the power of this other one who was in possession. And this, this one who was in possession, shut him up in his stronghold, dead. And even then, he broke the power of Satan. Thus Christ has demonstrated that he is not only stronger than Satan when he is alive, but that when dead, he is stronger than Satan. When dead, he was stronger than Satan, and therefore he came forth from the tomb and exclaimed before the universe, I am he that liveth and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and death. Very good. He is alive now. Thank the Lord. Well then, when a dead Christ is stronger than all the power of the devil, what can a living Christ not do who sits at the right hand of God today? Is there any room for our being discouraged? Is there any room for fear, even in the presence of all the principalities and powers and mights and dominions that the devil can muster on the earth? No, for he who is with us now alive, when dead, was stronger than Satan with all his power. Now Jesus is alive forevermore. We are alive in him, and his power is enlisted in our behalf, his living power. His dead power would be enough, wouldn't it? But he does not stop at that. It is living power. Be glad and rejoice and conquer in it. Jesus came unto the dominion and at last entered into the very citadel, of the stronghold, and the stronghold of the citadel of this illegal power, of this one who held the power of this world of might as against right. This one that is stronger than he entered in and took possession and came forth carrying the key and he holds them still. Thank the Lord. Then if this illegal power should even get some of us into the same place, into the prison house, it is all right. He cannot keep us there, for our friend has the keys. When he wants us to come forth, the key is turned. The door is wide open, and out we come. And to show how completely he did have the keys when he came forth, he brought the keys and holds them yet and forever. For that reason, it is written, and to every one of us is given grace according to the measure of the gift of Christ. Wherefore he saith, when he ascended up on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts unto men. He spoiled principalities and powers. He led a multitude of captives from this dominion of Satan and death when he came forth. It is written in the 27th chapter of Matthew, verses 51 to 53, speaking of the time of the crucifixion of Christ. And the earth did quake, and the rocks rent, and the graves were opened. And many bodies of the saints which slept arose and came out of the graves after his resurrection. The graves were opened at his crucifixion. And when did they come out? After his resurrection, assuredly. When he came forth, it is written, he divided the spoil. When he came forth, he led a multitude of captives, and when he ascended up on high, he led them on high in his train of captives, recovered from the hand of the enemy, or the land of the enemy. And that is the figure that is referred to here. In this, having spoiled principalities and powers and made a show 
in a grand parade of them openly, triumphing over them in it. The word triumph here refers to the Roman triumph. The Roman triumph was granted to the Roman general who had gone into an enemy's country, fought the enemy, taken spoil and captives from there, and brought them home to his own city. If any of the Roman citizens were captives in that land, he brought them home. And when his victory was complete, he had returned. The sentence, and he had returned, the Senate granted him a triumph. In this, his triumph, he was seated in a great and grand chariot, having six or more of the finest horses of one color, and he, drawn by these, with all the spoil and captives in his train, would parade up and down the streets of Rome, round about, everywhere, all the people out in the great gala day, doing honor to him in his triumph. Jesus Christ, our conqueror, the conqueror in our behalf, came into this land of the enemy, fought our battles, we were prisoners taken under the power of this illegal one. Our friend came here, our general fought our battles clear through. He went into the stronghold of the enemy and burst his bond and broke open the citadel. He brought the keys, he took the spoil. He brings forth the captives and leads, leads them in triumph upon high to his own glorious city. Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ. In him we triumph over this illegal power, this one whose is the power of might against right. And in this triumph over Satan, there is displayed before the assembled universe the power of right as against might. Now note, the power of right as against might can never use any might. Do you see that? Do you not see that in that lies the very spirit that is called of Christians, that is the very spirit of Jesus Christ, which is non-resistance? Could Christ use might in demonstrating the power of right as against might? No, to maintain the power of might as against right, might is to be used at every opportunity because that is the only thing that can be used to win. In that cause, the right has only a secondary consideration if it has any consideration at all. But on the other hand, the power of right as against might is in the right, not in the might. The might is in the right itself. And he who is pledged in to the principle of right as against might, and in whom that is to be demonstrated, can never appeal to any kind of might. He can never use any might, whatever, in defense of the power of right. He depends upon the power of right itself to win and to conquer all the power of might that may be brought against it. And that is the secret. Then don't you see that that explains in a word why it is that Christ was like a lamb in the presence of these powers? and this might that was brought against him. He had nothing to do with any using any might in opposing them. When Peter drew the sword and would defend him, he said, put up your sword. He that taketh the sword shall perish by the sword. When we get hold of that, all things will be explained as to what we shall do here, there, or the other place. We are pledged to allegiance to the power of right as against might, the power of love. And Jesus Christ died as a malefactor, abused, tossed about, mobbed, scoffed, spit upon, crowned with thorns, every conceivable, contemptible thing put upon him, and he died under it. In his appeal to the power of right as against might, and that power of right, which he died in allegiance to, has moved the world ever since. And it is to move the world in our day, as it never has been moved before. Just as soon as God can get the people who are professedly pledged to the principle to be pledged in heart to the principle and to put the thought upon nothing at all and never expect to appeal to anything at all other than the absolute principle of right and the power of it to which we are allied and to which we are pledged, then we shall see and the world shall see this power working as never before. So the one thing that we can say about this in the context of the present situation, when we look at the conflicts going on in this world, we can see 
that there's a lot of things going uh, awry in this world. And we can sympathize with the voices that recognize what's going on in the world, that things are a little crazy. But we can't ally ourselves with those powers because those are the power, for the most part, of the power of might, right? And you can't, you can't fight Satan on his ground. And, and you see this, because what, what is one of the problems that we have when you try to fight with honesty against deception? What's one of the problems? Let's say we, we try to, um, maybe that's not right the, the right way to say it, but we see all these deceptions, all of this corruption going on in the world. How do, how do we defeat it? We can't change the heart. Okay. So so if we if we decide to vote and get somebody into power who's going to put things right, what is that person going to use to put things right? They're going to use worldly power and right. They're going to use might, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So they're they're going to use might because the reason we would put them into power is so they could use their might to correct things. But then that's just the power of might against right. Once you use the power of might, it will always go against right. So you may have all the best intentions of the world. We could look at the politicians and see which ones are speaking and, and understanding what's wrong with the world. And then we want to put them into power so they can fix it. But are they going to fix it? No. no. They're just going to use the same power that was used before. The, the principalities and powers of this world are going to use their authority and their power and their might to fix things, which isn't going to fix things. The only thing we have is right. That is, as an individual, um, we need to do right. We need to be honest. The enemy is using dishonesty. They disguise their their goals. They they cloak uh, their aims in fancy language. But if you're honest and straightforward, uh, you can never fight against that. What ends up happening is you have to use the same methods they are using to beat them on in their own game. But once you beat them in your own their your their own game, you're on the same territory as them. You you're doing the same things, and that's what's going to happen in this world. We're going to see a backlash. The right, the political right, is going to seek the power of might and seek to correct things. But it's going to still be the same power that was used before. It's not God's power. It's not changing the human heart. And that's where we are in this world. And there's many Adventists I know who want to see you know, Trump to become president again so that he can fix things. But the things that need to be fixed are in our own lives. Those are the things that need to be fixed. And then if those things are fixed in our own lives, we can have the influence that those things can be fixed in other people's lives. So that when this controversy between Christ and Satan is fully acted out in this world, in the Sunday law, that those people who are understanding the power of right as against might will be on the right side of things and they will be in God's kingdom. So this is something to think, think about. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> any other thoughts before we close in prayer? Morning. I appreciate everything. Okay. Okay. Well, God bless. Okay. Let's pray. The dear Father in heaven, thank you for the Sabbath, and for the brothers and sisters in Christ who are seeking to to know the truth, to be Christ-like, to be trusting 
in what God can do, what God has done in Christ, and what Christ can do in us. We know, Lord, that um, we are sinners and we need your help. We pray for each person. We pray for uh, the truth in this world that is um, being worked out in the lives of many people that we don't even know of. We just ask, Lord, that we can leave all things in your hands, and that we can walk in the light that you've given. Be with each person, bless them, and be with us through the rest of the Sabbath. Through the Sabbath, uh, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.